do not be fearful, but be strong and courageous. Now is not the time to lean on your own understanding, but to have trust in your heart, for it is by God's grace that you are saved. The waters are rocky and the time is turbulent, but you are not alone. Fix your eyes on the unseen and do not lose sight of what lies ahead. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Well, welcome again, everybody. And if you are just joining us, uh, man, it's so good to have you. Uh, it is fun to come into your house. Thank you for welcoming us. And uh, hey, hey, isn't it fun to do church in our pajamas? Can I get an amen? Amen. I got to tell you, I'm a little bit jealous that you are in your pajamas and I am not in my pajamas. In fact, I've, I've actually been contemplating maybe next week I will come and do this in my pajamas. But here's the deal, church. You don't get too used to it. Uh, because uh, this, will, this will just be temporary, and then we're going to be back together. Uh, you might like this, but I don't, because you get to see me, but I don't get to see you. And uh, that's what church is, is being together. And so we're going to keep doing this as we have to through this crisis, but then we're going to be back together, and we'll let you know as soon as we're able to open the doors. And I'm excited for uh, the, the reunion that we'll all experience. Hey, when I was a kid, uh, there was a particular group of people that I was just drawn to. Uh, I started hearing about them when I was young, and I was like fascinated. I was intrigued by them. Whenever the teacher would ask, ask us to write a book report, it would be these people I would write a book report about. Now, the group I'm talking about are those people that we, we know as explorers, explorers. I'm talking about People like Magellan and Christopher Columbus and Ponce de Leon. You know, the guys that would have this thirst to understand what nobody yet understood, that were willing to get into a boat uh, and set sail without maps. In fact, the maps that they had, if you know this, they, they had edges and the ed because they didn't know if it was curved or flat or whatever. And the edge, beyond the edge, the map said, here be dragons. Not exactly inviting or comforting, right? But that's, they were going, you know what, we'll deal with it. And so they would hop in a boat and they would go. Uh, not only people who would travel across uh, the sea intrigued me, but also people who would travel across land, who had this natural curiosity of what's on the other side of that mountain? What's on the other side of that, you know, that desert? What's on the other side of that plain? What's on the other side of that continent? These people just intrigued me. People, you know, like... Uh, uh, John Muir and John Wesley Powell, Lewis and Clark, all of these kind of guys. And to this very day, uh, I'm just, I'm fascinated. Ernest Shackleton uh, wanting to go to Antarctica, the, the endurance, the whole journey, all of that. Sir Edmund Hillary wanting to climb Mount Everest. Nobody had done it. No, any people had tried and they had died, but they were willing to do that. And so it, it got me thinking, I want to ask a church, what would it take? What would it take for you to, hop in a boat where there was no map and just go wherever it goes, we're just going to go and we'll figure it out. What would it take for you to be the guy that would travel across a continent to just understand where does it end or to go to another continent just to become familiar with it in, in a way that nobody else had ever become familiar with it? Now, can I make an assumption about us? Most of us would say, not a chance. There is no way in the world I would do that. Uh, you don't, you know, uh, the only way I would go is if you could promise me that all the danger was minimized, you know, uh, and, and if I knew it was safe, then I might consider the journey. And then I would take, you know, I would take my helmet, my knee pads, my cell phone, and my chapstick, you know. It's like I don't want to be incredibly uncomfortable. Well, here's the deal. Uh, all of those explorers that I just mentioned, they all had one thing in common, and I want you to think about this. All of them had this one thing in common. Their journey was uncharted. It was uncharted. There was no way to know how we're going to get through this, which means, okay, which, which meant they had to figure things out as they went along. That's what it meant. Whatever they encountered, whatever came at them, there was not somebody who had already been there to tell them to get ready for. They had to just think, and they had to do it, which made Exploring, if you think about it, is dangerous. It's stressful. It certainly could be frightening. Um, but here's the deal. If you want to make progress, someone's got to go there. And 
and, and tell us what's out there. Kind of to boldly go where no one has gone before idea, right? Ring a bell? Uh, that's how you make progress. So today we're going to continue in our series. We started last week called Uncharted. And it's the idea of learning how to navigate uh, these waters we've never found ourselves in. The coronavirus has made explorers out of all of us. You, we are all on this adventure together. None of us chose it. None of us would choose it. But nonetheless, all of us are trying to figure it out. And uh, we are navigating in uncharted waters. And that's the journey. All right. Now, last week, we started the series Uncharted with a, a message titled uh, A Time Like None Other. Because that is what this is. It's similar to many other crises, but there are unique factors in this particular one. It is a time unlike any other. And uh, when, whenever you're in a time unlike any other, there's a, an emotion that dominates, and that's what, it's fear. I'm scared. And so we've just talked about it's, it's a scary time. And last week's message was on fear, and if you find yourself full of fear, I'd encourage you to go back and just listen to the verses that that uh, message was based on. Now, fear has a first cousin uh, named anxiety. Uh, fear and anxiety, I, like wherever you find one, you find the other. These two go together. They, they not only live in the same neighborhood, they live on the same block. I mean, they like, they grew up together. They, they hang in the hood. And so anxiety on the heels of fear makes this experience that we're on exploring right now is kind of a one-two punch. It, it's an incredibly stressful time. Now, I'm going to read a quote that Max Lucado said. Anxiety and fear are cousins, but, but not twins. Fear sees a threat. Anxiety imagines one. Fear screams, get out! Anxi uh, anxiety ponders, well, 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 what if? Fear results in uh, fight or flight, anxiety creates doom and gloom. Now, now you don't need me to tell you this, but there is no shortage of anxiety uh, today. There is none. In fact, I want to read you something that I think is interesting. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, um, anxiety disorders right now are, I mean, epic, you know, epidemic pr proportions, okay, anxiety. In fact, let me actually give you some numbers. In any given year, Nearly 50 million Americans will feel the effects of a panic attack, a phobia, or an, a, 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 some other anxiety disorder. They say anxiety disorders in the United States are the number one mental health problem among women and second only to alcohol and drug abuse among men. They go on to say that America is the most anxiety-ridden society on the planet. We, we're number one. They also, uh, one guy, a psychologist, Robert Leahy, pointed out, the average child today exhibits the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. Folks, we're anxious, but here's what you need to understand. Every one of these things I just gave you was before this particular pandemic we're finding ourselves in the midst of. So whatever that is, it's more intense now. Fear and anxiety, just this one-two punch. Now, today's title for the message is simply this title, Anxious for Nothing. Anxious for Nothing. Um, what good is all this anxiety accomplishing? Let me just, it's just, does anxiety ever help a situation? Are you ever better off just worrying about it? Now, when I say anxious for nothing, I want you to understand that's a title of a book by Max Lucado, and if you find yourself right now swimming in deep seas of anxiety, you might wanna pick up a copy of that book and, and just read it, all right? In fact, that book is the foundation upon which I built this message, and I'm just telling you there's lots of really good stuff in that book. But more important than that book is this book, The Word of God, and so I wanna encourage you to open your Bibles, and uh, hey, when you come into your living room to go to online church, Always bring your Bible, okay? So we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, and so if you'll just take a moment to find that. Now, while you're looking that up, I want to remind you of something I've shared with you before. Uh, because of Kindle, we've actually now been able to track, Kindle can tell us which books are the most highlighted books of all, 
And uh, they've discovered that the absolute most highlighted book of all is the Bible. But then you could say, well, what is the most highlighted verses or verse or verses in the Bible? And we can actually tell that, that the most highlighted verses in the Bible are in the text that we're about to read. I'll show them to you. But we're going to read together Philippians chapter 4. And right now, let's just read 4 and on down to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near here comes the most highlighted verses in the Bible. Starts right there. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Is this naive or what? I mean, come on, seriously, rejoice in the Lord always. Do not be anxious about anything. Give everything to God in prayer. Is this even possible? Who does this? Now look, we can conclude that whoever wrote this was one of two things, either living an incredibly plush life or was clueless about real life. One, this guy had everything going for him and no issues or was just absolutely out to lunch. We can conclude that, except the guy that wrote this was neither of those things. The guy that wrote those words was the Apostle Paul. And uh, you got to understand, those words were written not when everything was going great, but when everything wasn't going great. He was languishing in a dingy prison. He, he was awaiting trial. Trial for what? Trial to determine whether or not he was going to be executed or whether he was going to see the light of day again. He was not going through times that were trying. He was going through the trial of his life. And uh, he was on trial for his faith. He was, he was on trial for having this conviction about God that God is more than people thought he was. And he was so passionate about telling people the difference understanding who God really is would make in your life if you just understood. Now, he was willing to go anywhere and do anything for God. Uh, that was the Apostle Paul. He, he would just, do, he was like, I'll go, I'll check any, send me anywhere. Just let me tell people about Jesus. And, and I want to make sure you understand something. Let's go back to Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always from a prison cell. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, understand what he's doing. He's doubling down. Rejoice in the Lord always. Not always when it's good, not only when everything's working, not only when there's no fear, not only when you don't, aren't prone to be anxious, not only when, no, uh, not like one day a week, rejoice in the Lord always, doubling down, and again, I say rejoice. He's like, this is crucial that you understand this. How could you do this? How could you possibly rejoice no matter what comes at you and then rejoice again? So, so I thought about that, and I came up with this little formula. You could do this only if you believe certain things. Only if. Okay, here they are. Number one, that God actually exists. You could only rejoice in all circumstances if you believed God actually exists. Number two, that he cares about you. N number three, that he's in control. Number four, that he's all-powerful. And, and number five, that he's good. I'll stare at that list for just a moment. If you believe those things about God, then maybe you could, you could rejoice whatever comes at you. Here's what you have to understand. The guy that wrote those words believed all those things to the core of who he was. He believed that God was greater than his present circumstances. And this is the issue, church, we have to wrestle with. Do we believe that God is greater than this? Or is this bigger than God. Now, in the book of Isaiah, I love this book, uh, Isaiah chapter 26, it says this. Now, now, follow this. You will keep in perfect peace. This is like God. You will keep in perfect peace, God, those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. What does that mean? Everything else can shake. Everything else can, you know, everything can fall apart. 
but God never will. And when you believe that, then there is something that can happen in your life that will give you the ability to not only endure really difficult times, not just to endure, but not even to panic, but to actually come through those times with a spirit of rejoicing, uh, with a, 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 just this ability to go, God, you got this. Now, the big idea of, of this message is simply this idea right here. Your anxiety decreases as your faith increases. Church, say this with me. Say this out loud. I know you're in your living room. I know you're in your pajamas. Okay, we already talked about that, but I need to hear you say this. Your anxiety decreases as your faith increases. Say it one more time. Your anxiety decreases as your faith increases. What's the anecdote to anxiety? Faith. It will go up. Your anxiety will go down. Well, well but, but what, to do, what do I do when I'm prone to anxiety? Do exactly what Paul said. Let's go back to the most underlined verses in the Bible. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in every pandemic, in every, in every, we got no toilet paper, God, we got nothing. In every situation, God, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, now let's just take this in. Do, do not be anxious, okay, about any, but every situation, prayer and petition. All right, just wrestle with it, okay? Pray, which means focus, you know, our eyes are on you, God. See, if, if you're going to put your eyes on the problem, God's going to seem small, the problem's going to seem huge. Put your eyes on God, the problem won't be so big, you'll understand. Pray, uh, pray, ask, what specifically do you need? This is really important, church. Don't just throw up a prayer. What is the need that you specifically want to have God answer? Ask him and, uh, and do it with a spirit of thanksgiving. What's that mean? God, I, I, my heart, uh, I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to be overwhelmed with uh, little thoughts about you, but God, I'm so grateful for who you are, how big you are. What happens when you do that? Um, your, your mind is guarded, he says, by God, guarded. Literally sets a guard around your mind. You know, Philippians 4, 7, to just make sure you see it. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Explain this, pastor. I can, it transcends all understanding. How could I put it into words? But it's gonna guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a passage in Jeremiah that I, again, I think is so important in a time like this. Jeremiah 17, verses seven and eight. Let's just see this for just a moment. I, it's, it's gonna echo uh, Psalm one. If you're familiar with Psalm one, you'll hear the same language in Psalm one. But I wanna show you this. So blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Uh, they will be like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So what happened, so he's taken, he's taken a, a, a person and he's saying that person is, is gonna be like a, a, a tree planted by streams of water, okay? So you, you, and so you gotta run these, what would it be like to be the kind of person who's planted by streams of water if you were a tree, okay? Now this kind of person, I want you to see, see right here, it has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Can bring good out of the toughest of times in the most severe of conditions, no matter what happens, it's still something good is gonna come out. This is awesome, what kind of a person? Who is the person who is like a tree planted by streams of water who has no worries in a year of drought? He told you right here, the one who trusts in the Lord. That, that's the one that will come through this without an overwhelming amount of anxiety. In one of Henry Nouwen's books, he talks about um, visiting a circus and seeing a trapeze act the, by a group at the time by the name of the Flying Rodleys. And uh, he was so mesmerized by how graciously they were flying through the air and uh, he was so curious about how they did that. So he, he got one of the trapeze artists in a conversation and he said, how's that work? Like what, 
what happens? I want to read to you what Henry Nouwen wrote as what the guy said about how you do that, all right? So let me just jump right in here. The, the, the guy, it's called the flyer, okay? The flyer, the secret is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, my catcher, I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron. The, the worst thing the flyer can do is try to catch the catcher. I'm not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's task to catch me. If I grab Joe's wrist, I might break them or he might break mine, and that would be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly and a catcher must catch, and the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. Who's your catcher? In a time when you feel like I am flying through midair with no feet on the ground at all, I feel so uncertain. Can I remind you of these words of Jesus? In fact, let me just read them to you, all right? Just listen to what Jesus said. Because you know what I think he's trying to tell you is God wants to be your catcher. And uh, there's a whole different outlook on things when he is your catcher. Let me, from Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 25 to 34. Therefore I tell you, Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Does this not relevant for right this moment? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, and yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor Richest man on the planet was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. J Jesus said, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, the problem is, is we can become so focused on us, we don't even bother to look at him. We are so aware of our issues that we are totally unaware of his capacity. We are so caught up in our own insufficiency, we fail to understand his all-sufficiency. Now look more closely. Let me show you. Make sure you see this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, your anxiety decreases as your faith increases. Your, in, your, your anxiety, say it, decreases as your faith increases increases. Now, last thing I want to say here. On a, uh, a you know, recent trip to uh, Jerusalem uh, with a, a group from our church, which we uh, often go to Jerusalem, we often stay in the, a particular hotel. On the wall of this particular hotel, which I'll tell you about in just a moment, but this particular hotel has a framed, uh, I mean, it is, it's like a treasure. It's a handwritten lyric, uh, the lyrics to a song, it's the original handwritten lyrics to a song that uh, has become one of the absolute most beloved hymns of, of the world, of the church. And uh, it's right there on the wall. It, it's on the wall of the American Colony Hotel uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, the words were written by a man named Horatio Spafford. He, he was a very prosperous lawyer. He was a Presbyterian elder in a church. He, uh, he, uh, he lived in Chicago, and in the 1871 fire, he and his wife Anna suffered just kind of horrendous losses in that fire. In 1873, his wife and his four daughters with some friends were going to travel to Europe, and uh, 
he had to stay back to do some business, and so he put them on a boat, and off they went. And <clears throat> on December 2nd, he, that was in November, he put them on the boat, 1873, and then in uh, December 2nd, he received uh, word, a telegram from his wife. It began with these words, saved alone, what shall I do? He, he soon learned that that ship that his family was on collided with a British vessel and sank, and his four daughters were killed, and only his wife, Anna, survived. He uh, quickly left for England to bring Anna back home. En route, he was sailing on the ship, and he pulled out a, a piece of paper and a pen, and he wrote the words, this is what's on that wall in the American Colony Hotel in Jerusalem. He had no idea that this would come to mean so much to so many. But he wrote the words, and uh, this has become an anthem to God. Now, eventually, he and his wife, Anna, moved to Jerusalem. They started a ministry to care about people. They ended up uh, kind of forming, like, families gathering together. And they lived together in a house. It became a hostel, and then it became a hotel, and that is the American Colony Hotel. But let me, uh, let me just read the words of this song and see if you recognize them. When peace, he wrote this after he lost his four daughters. He wrote this maybe over the very spot on the ocean where his daughters drown. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows, like sea billows, roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know, when you understand what goes in to a writing of a song, the song can mean so much more. Right now, uh, you're going to hear a song. Don't go anywhere. You're going to be sorry if you do. Don't tune out. It's a song written by the worship leader, uh, Ron Petrovich, that was just leading us in worship, and the central worship team and the, our, the whole music deal here got behind it. And uh, they wrote this song. He wrote the song for a time we're in right now. And... Uh, it's called This Too Will Pass. Listen and pay attention to the words of the song, and then I'm going to come back out. Listen to this. Redemption in the morning And we know that 
Spirit of God is fixing what is broken. That's a promise that won't break from a God who's never changed. So let's press in and remember, hold fast, stay strong. Wow, is that not powerful? Uh, folks, I'm sitting here in the Gilbert Worship Center. I got a couple camera guys behind me. This is how we do church right now. And uh, just being able to listen and hear, you know, just be reminded this is going to pass. This is not here to stay. One day this room will be full of people again and, and we'll be back together the way, it, the way it was or better than it's ever been maybe. Who knows? But the, uh, the important thing is, is keep looking ahead to what God's going to do. And one of the best things that gives you a sense of what God's going to do ahead is to look behind you and see all the it was incredible memories that we have we share together as a church. And uh, we'll be back together again. You know, but there's something I, it's just on my heart right now. I just want to talk to you. Uh, I don't know why God's allowing this. And, and I'm in no way ever going to say I know. I don't know. But I know that he, I, I know some things about God. And if you just heard the message that I just gave, I said, you know, somebody who can rejoice in all things has to have something going on about God. And there was a list. Remember that list that he exists, that he's, you know, he's all powerful. He's in control. He cares, you know, and he's good. Folks, I believe all those things about God. I don't know why he's allowing us to go through this, but I can tell you this. I know that for many of us, we have long ago forgotten about God. And we have felt we have not needed him. And we have pushed him out of our lives and kind of out of our thinking. Maybe God is just going, hey, this is a wake-up call. Uh, we always think we can conquer anything and that, you know, death's not the obstacle. And this is a reminder, death is very, very real. And maybe through all of this, you're a person who goes, you know, I've drifted away from God I, I, when I was a kid. But it's been forever. And... Or maybe you go, I don't even know anything about God. Here's what you need to understand about God. God is, and God loves you. He, every one of us has an issue with sin. And sin is the thing that separates us from God. And we've learned, like in our time, how to play with sin and think there's no consequence. We can, like, a, it's a, like a live grenade and it's not gonna ever hurt us. It's not true, but we've come to believe that. What literally has happened is God has taken then that sin, that grenade, and he shielded us from the consequences of its explosion and he's literally taken the hit for us. That's what the cross is all about, that Jesus died for us. 
And uh, who would do that? Only someone who is really, really good, who really does love you and care about you and is all-powerful that could do that. Jesus died so that you could live. And you go, well, I, I, I want so desperately to have this. Here's what I need you to understand. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come into him and I'll dine with him. I mean, I'll literally, I'll do life with you. But I've said this so many times. God will not break your door down. He will not force his way in. He waits for you to open the door. He knocks gently. And then he says, when you're ready. Maybe you're now ready. Maybe, okay, all right. I, I really do realize how much I need God. I'm telling you, he's this close to you. He is just like literally, he's right there. And as far as we've run away from him, the minute we repent, which means to turn around, he is right there. It's not like we have to run all the way back to where we've left and to catch back up to God. God's been with you as you've gone away and he'll be right there if you just respond and turn around and open your heart. And I'm gonna pray for you to do that in just a moment. Now, again, normally in our services, we have time for communion. We set aside and we just go to remember this incredibly good thing that God did for us. He died for us on a cross. And um, we're gonna do that again. I don't know, I hope now you're starting to pick up a pattern. We'll do this every service. So maybe in advance, just set aside a couple of things for communion. We celebrate with some juice, which represents the blood of Christ and bread that represents the body of Christ. And we're just reminded that he gave us his blood and his body. And this is the price to have the freedom uh, from our sin. And we're, we're just, we're, we're, we recall that, we remember that. So let me pray. And I'm gonna pray for two things. I'm gonna pray that we would be grateful for what God did. That's for all of us who've already given our lives to him. And then I'm gonna pray for those of you who maybe for the first time have heard or learned something about God that you didn't know. And the best thing that'll come out of this crisis is that you will forever walk with God because you discovered him in the midst of this darkness. You saw the light. Let me pray and then we'll... Uh, spend this time in communion. So God, for those who already know this, we're so grateful. God, thank you for telling us and, and for whatever the circumstances of our lives, however it was that we came to understand these truths. God, thank you. Uh, when, when we break this bread, God, and we just, if we don't have that, we're just gonna, we're just gonna praise you and reflect upon the goodness. But for those who right now, maybe for the first time realize you really do love them and God, that you want them to live. You want them to have not just physical life, but spiritual life. God, that you have created within us the ability to, to give our hearts over to you to become so much more. And if it takes a crisis like this to open our eyes, God, just thank you for the crisis because I believe that many, many people will see you like they've never seen you. And I pray for everyone who's hearing my voice right now going, that's me. You can give your heart to him. Open the door, open him, open it wide. Just invite him in and you'll be amazed the difference it can make to get you through times like these. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.